Hello again, this is Daniel Edgar. I'm a technical product manager in the Nginx business unit at F5. This is the second installment in a series of videos regarding policy tuning with Nginx App Protect. In our first video, we reviewed what the default policy is, what it contains. We referred to some of the settings that you can tweak in there if you choose to override the default policy. But we didn't talk a lot about when you might want to update your policy and how to go about doing so. In this video, we're going to give you a basic overview of the process, what to look for that might indicate your policy may need to be updated, but also the basics of updating that policy, applying it, and checking to see if you have positive results. So let's get into it. In this video, I will be protecting the OWASP Juice Shop application. And if you're not familiar with it, it's an excellent resource for learning about application security provided by the OWASP Foundation. This application is a modern application. It's a SPA web application, single page app um, that has vulnerabilities associated with it. So we definitely need to protect it with something like Nginx App Protect WAF. So that is hosted on a uh, container and we've got Nginx Plus with App Protect module installed on it with the default policy. Let's see what that looks like. I have VS Code here and I'm remoted into my Nginx instance and we're going to look at the configuration. It's a pretty basic configuration. I've got my Juice Shop application configured as my upstream and I've got a server defined. I'm enabling App Protect on it and I have a policy file that I have created called mypolicy.json. I also have a security log enabled which is important to gain visibility regarding what is going on with my application and to aid in the tuning process. That log policy file is being used when sending messages to my syslog server, which is at a remote location. That syslog receiver is technically Logstash. And Logstash is a component of the Elk stack. So Elasticsearch Logstash Kibana. Today I'll be demonstrating the use of our ELK dashboard for F5 WAFs as part of the tuning process. This is very convenient, provides a very easy way to look at the output of your logs in Nginx App Protect in order to help assist tune and monitor those applications. You can use any sort of logging framework. This is just what I have chosen. So I've loaded the ELK based dashboard using the instructions contained here and I'm going to link to this in the video description and I've already got that up in my environment and the dashboard looks like this. There are no events yet so we're going to get to that a little bit later. Back to the configuration of our application I mentioned that we are using a policy that I've created based upon the default policy. I've essentially copied the Nginx default policy file to my own, and I'm calling it my-policy.json. As you can see, referring back to our last video, this is a very simple policy at this point. Now what about my logging configuration? Nginx App Protect allows you to decide what components are shown and available in your logging destination. I'm choosing to filter out all log events and just show illegal ones and send those to my elk stack. I can certainly log all events, but from a security perspective, I just want to see when there are alerts or blocks, as we talked about in our initial video. So I'm setting that to illegal. Alerts and blocks fall under the category of illegal. I'm also using the what's called the default logging format, and it's similar to a, a comma separated name value pair structure that's being sent over syslog to Logstash for ingestion in the uh, Elasticsearch database. And I have some details around maximum request size and maximum message size as associated with, e with each of those log events. I'm going to be exercising this application and I'm going to be ideally browsing the OWASP juice shop in a lower environment such as dev or test or UAT. That's one of the benefits of Nginx App Protect. It is so lightweight and integrates very well in CI/CD workflows that I can and should be testing my policy in lower environments rather than testing in production. But if I have a representative, um, if I have a representation of how my 
users are going to be using my application, I can certainly do that in an offline environment. And that's what I'm going to be simulating here. So as a user of this juice shop application, I'm going to request it via the browser, check to make sure that nothing's being blocked in the uh, application with my default policy, right? Things seem great. I've clicked on various things. And uh, from a functional perspective, it seems to be fine. So what might I be looking for in terms of security events? Well, since I've given it some, um, give, I've browsed it for a little bit and I've given it some traffic for the policy to take action on it, I can now go over to my dashboard and look for requests that might be showing up. I have my dashboard sent currently to look for events in the last five minutes. And in the dashboard, you can see various things have uh, created an alert condition. So something that App Protect has seen didn't block, but has alerted upon as uh, something that wasn't so severe that it needed to be blocked from its perspective, but also something that requires my attention as a policy builder. So was there anything I was doing that was uh, necessarily bad? Well, we need to look into that. So in the dashboard, I can look at how these violations, which we talked about in the first video, which violations might be triggered as suspicious, creating the alert condition in my dashboard. So in this case, illegal meta character in value was triggered. Well, I think I need to know a little bit more than that. So I see a list of all requests that had been sent to Kibana that were of, again, alert or blocking status. In this case, it was just alerted and um, a response was still sent to the user. However, I want to tune this as appropriate for my application so that I'm not seeing alerts for things I don't need to take action on or creating false positive situations where I'm blocking, worst case, on something that is really considered a part of the application. So let's dig into it and figure out what we need to do in our policy. So looking at one of these alerts, I'm going to take the most recent, and when I expand that, I'm going to see metadata associated with each of the variables that Nginx App Protect sent to Elasticsearch. I'm going to see things like the timestamp. I'm going to see the client application. In my case, I was using the Chrome browser, so that was there and the version associated with that. I'm going to see the destination port. My server was on port 80. Some geo IP location information, as well as source IP information. We can see the method, the outcome. So it was a get request and it was passed although it was flagged. The policy name, we talked about this before, it's important to name this uniquely so we know which policy needs to be updated. So if I bounce back to Visual Studio Code here and I go back to my actual security policy, you'll see that that matches my policy. So this is gonna be the policy that I'm going to need to update with any changes. So back further down the list, I can see the entire GET request and I can also see some additional information related to it, violation details that will be expanded here. So in order to make these kinds of adjustments, it's advantageous if you know more about the application so you can decide if this is something that should be allowed or not. This particular application uses socket.io and socket.io ideally works over WebSockets, which I don't have configured on my Nginx server. Digging into it deeper, this particular library will fall back to HTTP methods and pull occasionally using GET and POST. And that looks like what's happening here. So if I look at that request, socket IO, transport, polling, and I've got some other um, parameters associated with that request, and I can see the additional headers associated with that request. But that doesn't necessarily tell me enough about what's going on. So in terms of protocol compliance, we talked about in the first video, Nginx is going to start with a base level of protection of things it's going to expect to see in parameters as part of a normal web application. Uh, it also has the ability to uh, perform base64 decoding in case an attacker is trying to hide vulnerability exploits in a particular request and it's going to continue to examine those. But is that what's going on here? Well let's dig in. This particular case, this parameter by the name of SID, S-I-D, has a value that looks like base64. So Nginx App Protect is going to attempt to decode it looking for the source value. And that violation listed, if you look in our public documentation, is a vile parameter value metacar. So it has a problem with what's in that value after it decoded base64 in this case. 
Well, in looking to this application, which Juice Shop again uses Socket I/O, it will def by default create the session ID, and it's going to encode it as Base64 to become a unique identifier. Looking into it deeper, that particular value is derived by creating random number of bytes and then encoding it as base64. So do I really intend for AppProtect to decode that value? Is that value of any use to the application? In this particular case, it isn't. So I really want to instruct Nginx AppProtect to ignore what's going on in that particular field. That is being generated by my client application based upon random bytes encoded as base64 and sent to the backend server. So if I wanted to trust that particular parameter, I'm going to need to make a change to my policy. Nginx App Protect operates on entities such as cookies, headers, parameters, URIs in a very similar way. This particular case, I'm going to need to create a parameter exception for this named parameter, ideally, and instruct Nginx App Protect not to perform base64 decoding on it. How might I do that? If I go to docs.nginx.com, app protect, and look in our configuration guide, I can determine what needs to be changed in the policy to prevent app protect from base64 decoding, ideally just this single parameter. And here I've got an example of how to do that. So here in this section to the policy, I'm going to add a parameter section. That is an array. And an array is going to have, this particular array is going to have multiple items associated with it. What we're going to have to do is create a, an exception for the SID parameter. Explicit meaning I want it to exactly match that name. And then I'm going to disable base64 decoding. So in my policy, I'm going to add that section and make sure the values are appropriate for my application there. So again, I want to operate on the SID parameter, explicitly look it up, meaning not part of a substring. I want it's literally going to be SID, and I want to disable that base64 value. I'm going to save my policy. I'm on the server at this moment. And I'm going to reload Nginx, which is a non-disruptive operation. Once that's completed, I can attempt to use my application again. After a period of using my application again, testing it functionally, I'm going to go back over to the dashboard and reload it. We're no longer seeing that alert over the past period of time. So that means that policy change has prevented that alert or potential false positive from populating my dashboard. So I can again focus on block situations if I choose to in my policy tuning or when I operate my application, I'm only seeing things that might be potential problems that I need to address as a security professional. Our developers, both internal and customers externally, prefer to integrate with our web application or service using tools such as Postman, an HTTP testing and workbench tool. And when they call our application, they sometimes will be using some unusual HTTP methods or verbs. For instance, the purge method. And when we create a request using the purge method, we still get back the contents we're looking for. However, when we go back to our dashboard, that request has created an alert. Let's look at some of the details associated with that. It looks like the violations when calling with purge method, we're seeing illegal method and bot client detected. Well, let's take those one at a time. Again, we're going to be looking at the event details. So this particular case, yes, it was indeed the purge method that was called. And we need to allow that. So if you remember in our first video, there were a list of common HTTP methods in the default policy. And to do that, we're going to refer back to our docs.nginx.com slash approtect configuration guide. And in that guide, we're going to see a section related to allowed methods. So we're going to use this 
JSON property, the methods array, to add that purge method to our policy. Let's go ahead and do that. Back over to Visual Studio Code, and we're going to paste in that additional method. Now, we're not going to reload the policy at this time. We still have another violation we need to look into. If you recall, back over in Elastic, we noticed that there was a second violation that was causing the alarm. Bot client detected. And in this case, it wasn't actually a bot, but it was something that was a non-standard browser, something we wanted to be aware of. And that particular category uh, was a, it was a uh, HTTP library. So something that wouldn't potentially be used by end customers. But in our case, we intend it for, uh, intend for it to be used very often and we don't want to create alerts based upon that. So we need to create an exception to reclassify either Postman as a trusted bot or simply don't report out on it as a potential threat. And to do that, we're going to refer back to docs.nginx.com at protect configuration guide. And we're going to look at the bot signatures section. This is where we can apply settings regarding the handling of a particular user agent. So down here, this example where we're making some changes to the Python requests signatures related to bot detection, we're going to use an example such as this in our policy to allow Postman or to simply not report on it as if it were something that needs examination or alert. So we're going to go back to our policy. We're going to add a block for bot defense. We certainly want bot defense to be enabled because of the protections it provides, but we're going to make a small adjustment. We're not going to set for the particular uh, user agent detecting postman. We're going to just tell it to detect and not necessarily mitigate or alert on at that point. That way our users can continue to make use of it without cluttering our security logs. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to save our policy. And then I'm going to reload Nginx. So the latest changes in our policy are picked up. Again, this is a non-disruptive operation. New connections will simply use the new version of the policy, while older existing connections will continue to use previous versions. So what does that look like now? Back over to Postman. I'm going to re-request that using the purge verb, and again using my Postman user agent. Let's see what we get in the dashboard. And notice for our selected period, which was the last two minutes, I'm not seeing alerts any longer. So we've addressed both of those issues. Well, thanks for watching the policy tuning video in the continuing series of Nginx App Protect policies. Keep an eye out for future installments within this series, and we'll see you there.